All right. We're live everywhere except Instagram. There we go. On Instagram. <laughs> uh, hi, and welcome to uh, Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about a variety of books from a Marxist and anarchist perspective. I'm joined by Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Corey. How's it going? Thank you for hey. having me. It's going well. It's going well. It is. It except, is. Except for daylight savings time fucking us up. Yeah, the daylight savings time <laughs> did mess us up quite a bit, didn't it? Uh, but uh, we got that figured out. You know, man, it just it's so depressing because we were so close here in the U.S. to just making daylight savings permanent. And it was killed in the House by basically by Nancy Pelosi. It's like, I'm like, she, even on the little things, she can't do things right. Yeah, but anyway, she's just wrong about every single thing. She sucks. <laughs> God damn. Uh, you know, uh, and just her, um, the theater of the absurd when it comes to, to the Democratic Party. But anyway, yeah. so, uh, yeah, so it's been a bit since we've done a show. Um, we had a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, my, we, we took a hiatus uh, in, for most of March for my wife's birthday. And... Uh, so I've been doing a lot of reading, a lot of thinking in between. And so um, tonight we're going to be talking about a book that I'm very excited to talk about. That was a recommendation from one of our viewers, uh, Kerrigan. Um, and uh, the book tonight that we're talking about is um, Leninism Under Lenin by Marcel Liebman, um, which uh, I have this I have this copy, which looks really cool. It's got this like, nice. cool like kind of lithograph of Lenin on the cover. Um, this book was originally published, um, in the 1970s. Um, and Marcel Liebman was a very, very influential Marxist. Um, and I believe he was French. Um, he was either French or he was Swiss. I'm going to look this up real quick. Um, he was Belgian. He was Belgian. My bad. Okay. So he, he was Belgian. Um, he was um, obviously a Marxist, um, and he um, was uh, very active at the Université Libre de Bruxelles and the Vrie Université de Brussels. So very involved uh, in the sort of <laughs> Belgian Marxist milieu. Um, and you could say that Liebman was. Um, you know, I don't know if he explicitly identify himself as a Trotskyist, but it, it's a lot of the the viewpoints and the conclusions he tends to draw align a lot with Trotskyism. Okay. Um, and so a lot of the things that we'll discuss tonight about Lenin and Lenin's relationship to Trotsky and specifically Lenin's uh, relation to Stalin, a lot of it's informed by Trotsky. Um, and so... Um, I don't think that limits it. I just think that that you know, hey, this is kind of the perspective that this is in. So um, at this stage in my research and history of learning about the history of the Soviet Union and Lenin, um, I'll have to say right out the gate that I think outside of Lenin's own works, this might be the best book on Lenin I've ever read. Okay. Um, I think it's very even handed. It is incredibly balanced with and not just in terms of perspective, but also in terms of source material, like he's pulling a lot from Lenin's own writing, which okay. is something that a lot of books about Lenin don't do. <laughs> like mainstream okay. books about Lenin don't always do this. Um, and so, you know, he, he, he basically, you know, you have some sort of more right wing historians who will sort of say, oh, well, Lenin just said that because he wanted to, to gain power, blah, 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 like very simple, sort of superficial. But Lehman saying, no, like there's really, there's real content here in regards to um, the, what Lenin is writing and speaking. Okay. Um, this book, uh, its scope is kind of tremendous. I mean, it basically covers, you know, 30 years of history, you know, 35 <laughs> years of history. Um, right. In one in, book, eh? In one book. Um, and does it with, uh, I think, a rather deft hand. Um and, you know, he, he basically, in the beginning, in the introduction, he writes about how most of the writing on Lenin that often is sort of two sides of the same coin. It's either Lenin was the greatest revolutionary who ever lived, who did all of these extraordinary things, right? Like the kind of more the hagiographical writing on Lenin. 
And the flip of that, the sort of reverse image of that is that, you know, Lenin was this absolute horrific tyrant who, you know, led to the deaths of millions and blah, blah, blah. So right. there's like this, like, and Liebman's whole thing is uh, I'm right out the gate. He sort of says, Hey, this is not the perspective you're going to get from me. You're not going to get the worst ever. You're not going to get the greatest thing ever. What you're going to get from me is a balanced portrait of sort of calling it, calling things that went well or things that were good about Lenin and Lenin's ideas saying when they're good, then saying when they're bad, they're bad and saying right. when they are limited. Um, and I think it's, it's really refreshing to read somebody who's sympathetic to Lenin, but also critical of him, which is, is I think pretty interesting. And, um, and uh, he actually is, a, he actually quotes the, the late great Marxist Isaac Deutscher, who wrote a sort of classic biography of Trotsky, also wrote a biography of Stalin, um, where in Deutscher's biography of Trotsky, he writes, free from loyalties to any cults, I have attempted to restore the historical balance. <laughs> and I think that's what this book does. I think it does okay. a very good job of laying out a lot of the both the successes of Leninism and the limitations and failures of Leninism. Right. Um, in a way that is both understandable um, and because it, there's a lot of moving parts. I mean, we've talked about the Russian revolution on this show. We've talked about um, the early years of the Soviet Union on this show. And, yep. and there's a lot of different factions and they're all kind of playing off one another. And Lenin is kind of the central figure who is the collective glue that holds these different factions together. Right. Um, and, and when his political life is, sort of cut short um, after a series of strokes, really starting in 1922, um, the future of the Soviet Union becomes very, very uncertain. And many different factions start to vie for power and ultimately Stalin wins. Um, and that leads to the, the sort of, in, in Liebman's mind, and I think in mine too, the sort of the, 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 the defeat of the Soviet dream, the mm -hmm. real defeat of what the Soviet Union could have been. Um, and that's no slight to the, some of its successes throughout the right. rest of its history, but like they're deeply limited by the limited political vision that was sort of thrust upon that early period after Lenin's um, incapacitation and, and death in 1924. Right. So what I think this book does a really good job with too, in terms of broad themes, and then we can get into specifics, is Lenin as a politician I think the thing that we don't often think about when we think about Lenin is we think of him as a political theorist. Mm -hmm. We think of him as a revolutionary. We think of him as a, uh, an analyzer of capitalism, a Marxist theoretician, philosopher. All of those are true. But at the end of the day, he was a master politician. Mm. And that's something that like doesn't always get caught in a lot of the readings of Lenin that I read is how deeply good at politics he was, <laughs> right. which is, you know, and, and, and for me as somebody who loves American history, I also am a big, not only am I a student of the Soviet Union, but I'm also a student of the United States. I'm a student of the American presidency. And so as I was reading this book, I sort of was thinking, okay, what if I start thinking about Lenin as if he was a president? Like what, what, what presidency would he be the closest to? Okay. And I think the presidency that he would be probably the closest to is um, is probably Woodrow Wilson uh, in terms of the, the 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 broad strokes of sorry terrible pun there related to both Wilson and Lenin um, the, the the broad outlines of their political careers. Wilson was president for eight for eight years from 1913 to 1921, and he has a very successful first term. He he, he passes a slew of hugely progressive reforms. Um, you know, limiting child labor, enacting the Federal Reserve Act, which creates the Federal Reserve, which sort of stabilizes the banking system in America. There's all kinds of stuff that happens in the, in the antitrust leg legislation. There's a lot of stuff, really good things for American democracy that happened in the Wilson era. At the same time, Wilson was, and this is not like Lenin, but Wilson was also a uh, unrepentant racist. 
um, who screened Birth of a Nation in, in, in his White House. Right, yeah. Um, which glorified the KKK. He also led a horrific intervention against Mexico. Like, there's a lot of terrible shit about Wilson, too. We may be wrong. But what makes them very similar is that Lenin broadens his outlines as he becomes a political figure and recognizes the international scale of his job. Right. And Wilson kind of does, too. And at the peak of their powers, they both have debilitating strokes, which kind of destroy their ambitions. Um, Wilson has a stroke in 1919 while um, doing a nationwide tour, trying to gin up public support for the League of Nations post-World War I. Lenin, of course, has his stroke in 1922, um, his first of a series of two or three, where he loses, he loses um, use of one of his arms, and then by 1923, he loses his ability to speak, um, which is fairly similar to, to Wilson. Um, and what happens after Wilson in the 1920s is sort of a period of retreat and conservatism of, and corruption with Warren Harding and, and, and Calvin Coolidge. And you could say that the Stalin period is kind of the same thing. It's a, it's a period of retreat. It's a period of counter-revolution, which um, leads to disastrous consequences. Um, so that's the stuff that I was thinking about as I was reading the book. was just like L Lenin is this guy who is often written about as sort of being above the fray, right? We don't think of him as like kind of being in the thick of it. But it's like he is. He's a politician. Right. Like it's, it's don't ever lose the sight that the man is a politician. And the reason I mention these things is because one of the, the, the another key sort of concepts from the book that gets through is Lenin's pragmatism. So Lenin is a deeply pragmatic leader. Um, and so he often changes course on particular ideas, whether or not how related to the masses does a political party become? How okay. much level of spontaneity do we allow a political party to take on? Mm. Um, what is our relationship to originally existing or previously existing democratic institutions like the constituent assembly. And Lenin is playing all these things out. And so he's somebody who, like any good politician, kind of takes, he kind of takes, kind of takes the wind, you know, sort of reads the tea leaves and kind of gets a yeah. sense of where the, where, the, where the public is on anything and how far you can go. Um, great leaders can only go, I heard this from an historian recently, you know, great leaders can only take their, their folks so far ahead because if you get too far ahead, they can't follow you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I think that Lenin was like that. I think that there are times where he would make decisions, whether it was related to the ending of the constituent assembly, whether it's the Kronstadt rebellion, whether it's the institution of war communism and the new economic plan the NEP mm. in the 1920s after the Russian Civil War. These seem like positions that seem like a betrayal of the revolution. But Lenin does all of these things in service of a longer goal. Like he has a longer, longer term goal, which is that if we can keep the Soviet Union kind of plugging along here, these other nations will join us and then we can have the global revolution that we want. Mm. That that's that that's you know we talked about this in the Trotsky episode. Yeah, um, and I think that's very true. That there was always in the back of his mind that these other nations will become communist too. We will then be able to unite, unite together and build an alternative world order. Right, and that never really happens. Yeah, at least it doesn't happen in Lenin's era, and so. And it's the same with Wilson. You know, Wilson fights for the League of Nations, which was sort of a precursor to the, the United Nations. Republicans in Congress don't like it. Yeah. And they fight him tooth and nail on it, um, especially one of the specific articles that said that, that the United States would have to join into a conflict if one of our other nations was being attacked. Very similar to NATO. And, uh, and so... You know, he's fighting for this because he has this longer term goal, which is like we're going to tie the, the, the world together with sort of liberal bourgeois sort of politics. And uh, and you can say, well, that's like a soft form of imperialism, which it is. But um, but at the same time, that was the long term vision. Right. So sometimes in politics, you have to do short term things that aren't great in order to get to a longer term goal that's actually better. Right. The problem is sometimes those long-term goals never happen. Yeah. And all we're left with are the series of choices that you've made to that point. 
Yeah, that's right. So you've made a series of bad choices and never got the long-term goal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You've made a series of bad or questionable or sort of expedient choices. Yeah. And so I think this is the limitation of Lenin where in his feverish quest to get that international revolution, he makes choices which actually limit the capacities of the revolution at home, which then have an influence on the potential of revolution abroad. Yeah. So one of the ways in which Lenin is very influential and the first part of the book talks about this is what is, what is in Liebman's mind, what is his, what is Lenin's long-term legacy? And that's the development of the party and the political party and what the political party represents and how it's structured and how it governs and how it functions is the core of Leninism. It's, it's what makes Leninism what it is. And so Lenin is developing these ideas as somebody who's a student of the law uh, and who is a lawyer by trade, right? So like any politician, a lot of politicians, what do they start as? Lawyers. Yep. You know, um, you know, Wilson was an historian, but, uh, but like Lincoln was a lawyer. Um, Barack Obama was a lawyer, you know, like all the lawyers are people who know what the laws. And so Lenin's whole thing was, I need to understand the system in order to subvert it. Right. So that was his main goal in the early years before he really starts the development of the party. So before they're known as the Bolsheviks or the Mensheviks or any of that, you have what's called the RSDLP, the the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. Okay. The RSDLP is essentially what the Communist Party would become in the 19-teens, late 19-teens and early 1920s. Right. Um, By 1918, 1919, they're really explicitly calling themselves the Communist Party. But before that, it's the RSDLP. And... Lenin is theorizing what a political party should look like. And so in this particular conversation right now, we're going to kind of retread some familiar ground. Okay. Um, but I think it's relevant to the conversation for those who are new, which is that, you know, Lenin's conception is the idea of a vanguard party that's made up of professional revolutionaries. Oftentimes they're intellectuals, right? A lot of times they come from a bourgeois background, yeah. you know, um, yeah. uh, which of course Lenin did, Rosa Luxemburg did, Marx and Engels did, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, on the anarchist side, Peter Kropotkin did, he was a prince, yeah. Yeah. you know? So a lot of these people come from that sort of bourgeois. Mikhail Bakunin li- did. B- yeah, Bakunin <laughs> did, right? So, yeah. you know, it's a lot of that where these people are, exposed to levels of learning and political consciousness that most people are not. Yeah. And the, the big, so one of the, one of the criticisms of Lenin is that, Oh, well, this is just Blankian Blankism. Right. Blankism is the idea of just like sort of a, a sort of dictatorial party that tells the working class what to do. And Lenin never really conceived the party like that. Lenin conceived the party more as, as a relationship between the people so, you know, and again, that goes back to that idea that a leader can only go so far or the people fall behind. Right. Lenin understands that dynamic very clearly. And you can see that in the early years of the RSDLP. Um, so in 1905, 1904, 1905, you see these big revolutions that happen in Russia. We talked a little bit about this in the Rosa Luxemburg episode because she wrote about them um, in the mass strike. Right. Um, and Trotsky wrote about them as well. And so you have this huge upsurge of, of, of political and social consciousness that leads to widespread revolts, trade revolts, general strikes all across the country. And what you see with Leninism is that the political party as an idea expands in times of revolutionary fervor and the Mm. potentials of revolution and contracts in eras of reaction and counter-revolution. So in 1905, it's a revolutionary period. So the party begins to expand. More members are added to the party. More ancillary members, what we might call fellow travelers, um, are a part of the party. Because like Mm -hmm. Lenin's whole thing is like, I don't give a shit if you consider yourself a member of the party or not. If you help the party financially and you help us logistically, you are better to me than someone who says they're a part of the party and does nothing. Right. 
which is contrary to one of his rivals, which was Julius Martov, who was one of the leaders, who would become one of the leaders of the Mensheviks and was an outspoken critic of Lenin. Martov's whole idea was, well, if you be broadly believe in the party platform and you financially support the party, that's good enough. Like, that's fine. Okay. You know, you could say that Martov is more of like a DSA or where it's like it's a big tent. You can buy your party dues, maybe show right. up at a couple of protests. You're good to go. Yeah. Lenin's like, no, 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 no. Like we want full time professional people doing this work. Yeah. Because these are the people who can then help the masses understand their own sense of consciousness. And so you see this huge groundswell and, and the RSDLP grows dramatically during the 1905 period. Unfortunately, this is this is short lived. You know, by 1907, there's a counter-revolution that happens in Russia. You know, the czarist regime sort of does a crackdown um, and, you know, limits civil liberties, you know, goes after the working class, sort of fights back against their revolt. Right. And in that time period from about 1907 to about 1912, the party really shrinks and okay. it becomes very, very small. It's It becomes many few, very dedicated cadre. And it's not, it's not a mass force of mass politics. Right. It goes into retreat. And, and, and it goes into a retreat specifically because if a party, in Lenin's conception, if a party were to grow during a period of counter-revolution, there's the potential of outside agitators becoming a part of the party and undermining it from within. Mm -hmm. Which we know is true yep. because of COINTELPRO. Yeah. So we have an historical example, you know, two or three generations removed from Lenin that is exactly that, where in the United States you had the COINTELPRO, pro, you know, COINTEL pro, the counterintelligence program, where, you know, members of the American national security state infiltrated political parties and undermined them from within. Yeah. Because in the by the 1960s and 70s, political parties, especially left political parties, stopped yeah. being the big tent. And as you get into the late 60s and early 70s, it's a period of counter-revolution and retreat. You know, it's the fucking Nixon era, right? Yeah. And so the party, the parties kind of con contract and they become extremely sectarian, as yeah. the RSDLP did post-1907. And they uh, start kind of turning on each other. Because you can only oh. trust your comrades that are exactly... <laughs> Bingo. This is right. Yeah. And so... That that undermines left political movements yeah. from within. Same thing. Lenin was was very acutely aware that these things could happen and had happened. Right. Um, that there could be you know outside agitators who could ruin the party and ruin the party's goals. So Lenin takes the time from like 1907, basically a 10 year period, part of which he spends in exile in Switzerland from like 1914 to 1917 theorizing and continuing to theorize what the political party is, how political party is developed in relationship to the masses um, and how that party would take power. And I will stop it there. If we have any comments or questions before. We yeah. Uh, Some random geek has uh, mentioned a couple of things. Um, this one here is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Lenin didn't want someone like Stalin to be in charge, right? He warned his comrades against that. Absolutely. So Lenin, and so Lenin's relationship to Stalin is very complicated, um, but the short answer is you're right. Um, most accounts, most mainstream accounts, whether it's bourgeois historians or Trotskyists um, or people who are not sort of of the sort of tanky left, they would they would pretty much say yes, this is the case that initially. Um, uh, because Stalin gains power as being the commissar of, of nationalities. That's like one of the key roles he has in the early Soviet government. And in that role, he sort of carves out power for himself. Mm. Um, he takes a role which on the surface doesn't look like something that would have a lot of power and gives a lot of power to it. Yeah. And a parallel in American history would be Lyndon Johnson becoming the majority leader of the Senate in the 1950s. It's a role right. that, Majority leader is not really that big of a role in the 1950s when Johnson takes it over. Johnson completely reconfigures the role to be the most powerful role um, in Congress no. outside of the Speaker of the House. So um, Lenin initially, I mean, he is, a, I mean, Stalin is elected 
to the party. I mean, he's elected. It's it's not like he sort of when when Stalin gain, gains power, it's kind of soft coup because he's already kind of in power, right? Right. But by 1922, Lenin is very aware that um, that Stalin's not the right guy. Yeah. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later when we talk about the end of the book. Okay. Um, but I, I, want, I want to do that out of order. <laughs> Fair. Uh, yeah. And then uh, also regarding uh, presidents being lawyers, a lot of politicians in the USA and elsewhere are, I bet, and or are or were lawyers. John Adams was a lawyer. Yes, John Adams was a lawyer, um, and 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 a very astute one. So was his son, John Quincy Adams. I mean, John Quincy Adams is probably most famous case was the Amistad case, where he took it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. His Amistad was a boat that was um, a, a slave revolt on a boat of people who had been st stolen from Africa who were slaves in the first place, um, and the federal government was trying to claim them as slaves and. Uh, they took their case all the way to the Supreme Court. They were they were led in that by John Quincy Adams, and gets and he gets their freedom. He, he ensures yeah. their freedom. Um, and uh, there's a good movie about it, a good Spielberg movie where Anthony Hopkins plays John Quincy Adams. Um, okay. Came out in the '90s. John Quincy Adams is kind of a badass, and we can talk about him in another episode about American history. But For sure. he's actually kind of cool in some ways. <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, yeah. So yes, most politicians are lawyers, right? Because it's like. Why? You know, what else would they be? I mean, a lot of yeah, politicians right. don't. You know, a lot of politicians don't. You know, some politicians are doctors. You know, some politicians are small. Every time, or... <laughs> every time, yeah, a politician isn't something like a lawyer or like something like that. Mm -hmm. the, the people who dislike them are like they they use that against them. Like they they like. Oh like, yeah, uh, I mean Justin, Justin Trudeau was a uh, a teacher, so naturally he's unqualified to be the prime minister. You know stuff like right. That. Like, I mean, to me, the AOC most was a bartender. <laughs> yeah, AOC was a bartender. Not to mention the fact she had a like she had like an international relations degree or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah. forget yeah, that. Um, no, <laughs> I mean, I think the biggest example of this is Ronald Reagan, right? Like an yeah. actor, like a B movie yeah. actor. You know, there's that great line in Back to the Future where 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 um. Marty goes back to the fifties, meets Doc Brown and Doc's like, okay, well, who's, who's president. And, yeah. uh, and Marty's like Ronald Reagan. He's like Ronald Reagan, the actor, who's his vice president, Jerry Lewis. <laughs> um, you know, um, yeah. although I think one of the weird things about Reagan is Reagan is the only president ever elected who was the president of a union. Mm. He was the head of the string actors guild. We've never had a president before or since who was the head of a union. Yeah, and he and he, he was like the most anti-union, anti-union, <laughs> destructive unionist yeah. imaginable. Yeah, um, that's why, like, I always say, you, people always say that only Nixon could go to China. It's like, well, only Reagan could go after the air traffic controllers. Like, yeah. you know, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, most politicians are lawyers, and so is Lenin. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, regarding the the privilege, and uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon was also uh, privileged, of course. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, yeah. like very few, you know, at least from the, the, the original period, right? The yeah, like century. that's who had the time and the uh, education to yeah. focus on these kinds of things, right? So like your per average person working in a feudal system doesn't have the opportunity to go and read political theory and understand the political system of the day so much. Exactly, exactly. And so what you, so we pivot into talking about the revolution and we've covered the Russian revolution this, on this podcast. If you want to learn more of the details of the Russian revolution that we can't get into tonight, you can check out our um, episode about uh, the Russian revolution and the two books we cover in that episode. Um, but long story short, 1917, October, Russian revolution happens. Yeah. And we're going to gloss over a lot of history here for the sake of time. But what you see in this period is a period, again, of what I was saying about the party, a, par a period of expansion. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Bolshevik party, let, in tandem with the Soviets, which were set up pre-Bolsheviks taking power. I mean, the Soviets had existed for years before the, before the Bolsheviks actually took power. You have the struggle in the, the, the party, the RSDLP and later the Communist Party, uh, between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. The Bolsheviks mm -hmm. were more aligned with Lenin 
and the Mensheviks were more aligned with people like Martov. Um, and ultimately, the, the Mensheviks were sort of conciliatory to power. They were willing to work with the provisional government. They were willing mm. to sort of make those kinds of amends. And the Bolsheviks were not. They were like, no, we can't govern with these people. They will undermine us at every step, which is right. It, ultimately, that was right. So in this period, you get a phrase that you know, I think is interesting when we think about the state of re state and revolution, you know, Lenin's, you know, full, you know, tracked about the state revolution. And, and we've covered that on the podcast. So, you know, listen to that episode for some more context. Um, but, uh, but with the state and revolution, what Lenin is doing is embracing some things that he hadn't before. Again, this is the pragmatism of the politician kind of coming in, reading the, reading the wind and saying, okay, I need to go where the currents are going. One of them is in the notion of spontaneity. So spontaneity is a key theme that we think about in terms of the Revolutionary Party and politics. Um, Rosa Luxemburg, of course, is probably the most foremost sort of Marxist supporter of spontaneity. Right. And the idea of the mass strike and sort of following where the, you know, instead of leaders taking the working class where they want to go, it's the working class taking the leaders where the working class wants it to go. Um, and Lenin becomes more and more amenable to that. Um, and what you see in this period is what Marzo Liebman calls libertarian Leninism. Because there's a lot of that, especially in state and revolution. And I know you've mentioned that too, where it's like, oh, some of this sounds like anarchist stuff. <laughs> and uh, and he's actually becomes more and more conciliatory to anarchists during this period. They become a part of the revolution. Right. Um, he, he thinks of them in a lot of ways very positively, um, even up into the Kronstadt rebellion. I mean, some of the, the Kronstadt rebels, um, you know, Lenin before the revolt had said to them, he said, you know, if more anarchists were like you, I mean, we could make this revolution a serious thing. We could take this country over and make it better for everybody. Like we, I, I can trust you. I can work with you. Yeah. Um, Cause one insight that you get out of the, the Kronstadt rebellion is that uh, at least from Liebman's account is that the, the workers in Kronstadt hated Trotsky far more than they hated Lenin. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, there's this great about story right. about when, when the red army gets into Kronstadt, they're sort of, they're quelling tensions all these pictures of Trotsky that have been put up and taken down, but Lenin's mm -hmm. pictures are still up, you know, and Lenin himself had even met Nestor Makhno, the, the, the great Ukrainian anarchist and then sort of thought of him as being favorable. So, so you have a period of like, you know, 1917 to about 1919, 1920, where Lenin is far more conciliatory to anarchists than the standard history portrays. Right now, I will say right out the gate that when it came to the Kronstadt rebels, he basically said, I'm not going to arrest you, nor am I going to execute you, um, but you're going to be released and you need to leave the country. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's it you know, it only goes so far, right? <laughs> right. And, and, uh, and then obviously, you know, with the revolution comes the growing pains of setting up a government, right? Uh, you know, it's, again, as, as an American history geek, I always think of it as sort of similar to the election of 1800, Thomas Jefferson is elected to the presidency. It was completely different than Washington and Adams. He's part of the, the, the Democratic Republicans, that political party instead of the Federalists. And he does things that would sort of portray his political principles. So, you know, Jefferson, who was always about sort of limited government and, you know, sort of libertarian, um, doesn't want the executive to usurp power, but then you know, behind the back of Congress buys the Louisiana Purchase. Mm -hmm. It sort of says, oh, we'll approve it later, right? And, and he buys that in sort of a longer term goal. It's like, well, we're doing that to build the country. We're doing that to build the nation. And Lenin does a lot of the same things. I mean, I think of the, the Kronstadt Rebellion and, and quelling the Kronstadt, Kronstadt Rebellion as an example of this. He's like, we can't have forces within our working, within our revolution undermining our goals, our broader goals. We cannot have them doing that. So we have to put this down in order to, to facilitate a longer term goal of the setting up of a national government that would then connect with other national governments around the world that were communist, that would then start the working class global revolution. Unfortunately, it never happens. Um, but, uh, and so you see in this period the development of 
uh, Lenin as a tacticianer, as a tactician of power. And he is very comfortable with it, which is part of the reason why I think he was successful in the early years. Contrary to, say, somebody like Kerensky, who was the head of the provisional government from February to October of 1917, who was, I think, in some respects, a very reluctant leader and not particularly willing to sort of grab the bull by the horns. Mm. Um, one lesson, I think, of history is that with leaders, especially, um, that you start you start you start right away and you start hard. There's no, you know, it's, there's no, don't ease into it. You have to do it. You have to, you have to sort of grab the reins and do it or, or it will fail. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Lenin was comfortable with that. Uh, and obviously that has limitations, right? We can talk right. about this sort of concentration of power. And that's one of the limitations of Leninism, I think, is that concentration of power that, in times of counter-revolution and reaction, the parties sort of, con they contract, the party contracts and sort of relies upon these deeply connected figures of the period, who, uh, deeply connected figures of the party who have power and wield power. And so, you know, early on after the revolution, you see a lot of localities kind of doing their own thing. And for the most part, Lenin's fine with it. I mean, his whole thing is like, let them pursue what they want as the working class. We need to trust them, so on and so forth. Those impulses are shortened by the Russian Civil War. And when the white army, backed by U.S. money and, and guns, <laughs> um, starts to fight against the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union does go through a period of contraction where it has right. to sort of batten down the hatches and and fight for its mere existence because, you know, uh, it was not, you know, the revolution was not a picnic. It was not something that made everybody happy right away. Right. There's this sort of standard narrative, that, like the revolution happens and everything is wonderful. It's like, no, like it was That's, really hard. Yeah. Um, you're taking a country which is essentially medieval in, in its sort of economic outlook. I mean, it was barely right. get emerging as an industrial state. It was mostly feudal, right? Yeah. Uh, and peasant oriented. And trying to make it a, a working class government. Yeah. And that's another key element with Leninism is that in the integration of the peasants within to the econ the in, within the political party and system. That it isn't just, you know, all power to the workers and the peasants, right? It's it's that you know, peace, land, and bread, right? We, nice. And so there's always that relationship between different factions. And how much you can back one over the other. Again, this is Lenin being a politician, trying to figure out, okay, how much can I do for the peasants and how much can I do for the working class for them to, right. be, to be a happy partnership? And that partnership was always tenuous because they had different goals. Right. And so, um, you know, as we talked about in the Rosa Luxemburg uh, episode, she was very critical of, of Lenin's sort of what she saw um, as a um, sort of blind sort of uh, allegiance or sort of blind faith in the peasantry. Mm. Um, she said that they had potentials to be reactionary, which is true. I mean, you think, uh, you think of the, you know, um, during the, the early thirties, during the, the, the Holodomor, you have the Kulaks who essentially tell Stalin to go fuck himself. Um, right. and, uh, you can say whether that was the right choice or not, but like that <laughs> ultimately it was a choice that they made. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's something that would have maybe would have happened under Lenin, but right. did under Stalin, um, because Stalin didn't care, you know, Stalin was, was, you, if, if Lenin was somebody who worked with like a perfectly sharpened Ticonderoga number two pencil, Stalin was somebody who worked with like the shittiest ballpoint pen. <laughs> like, and, you know, it just didn't have the level of like finesse right. of thinking about the different factions in the way that Lenin did. But the Russian Civil War does make things very difficult. And with the with the failure of the German Revolution, with the failure of the Hungarian Revolution, with the failure of the Polish Revolution and ultimately the, 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 the Soviet Union invading Poland to sort of 
uh, uh, quell a revolution that was not going to go their way. Mm -hmm. um, you see a global revolutionary movement in retreat, you know, and so Germany doesn't go communist, Russia, you know, Poland doesn't go communist, Hungary doesn't go communist. When all of those things happen, it sort of, it, it sort of gets to a period of, again, batten down those hatches, right? Gets get inside and sort of let's let's um, ride this out. Yeah. And unfortunately, Lenin didn't live long enough for for him to ride it out. Um, yeah. But one of the ways that he tried to start writing it out was the new economic policy. What that was, was, you know, early, right after the Russian Revolution, I mean, they, they're nationalizing industries, they're taking over land, they're doing all kinds of stuff to yeah. collectivize society. And what the NEP is, is it's sort of a retreat from that, where we said, we're going to have some private enterprise, we're going to have some for-profit businesses, we're going to have some kind of mixed state capitalist economy right. in order to weather the storm of the Russian civil war and the effects of the Russian civil war in the early 1920s. And so this is a period where the sort of libertarian Lenin is gone. Like he's, that's done. Right. Um, and so it's any good politician and especially any Marxist is going to respond to what conditions are provided to them. They're going right. to do what they have. They do what they can, what they've got. And any good politician is going to do that. And Lenin did too. Um, and so this is certainly the case with the NEP. It's certainly the case with the right of nations to self-determination, um, which Lenin was very big about. And we've talked about in previous episode, we talked about Lux Rose Luxemburg, who was against it. Mm -hmm. And her logic about that was, well, if we have, um, if we have nations pursue self-determination, Maybe they'll become bourgeois countries. Maybe they'll become counter-revolutionary, right, reactionary right. countries that will fight against us. So we don't need to fight for them. What we need to fight is for the global working class. And under that umbrella of the global working class are these developments of these working class nations. But the right. working class as a class comes first and the nations kind of come second. Um, I think some of that's true. But I also think that Lenin was right to a certain extent about self-determination in that it was sort of a, um, it was sort of an olive branch to countries that may not have gone with the Soviet Union. And, right. Um, it, it's saying here for I'm, fear of being, yeah, like over determined or dominated. Right. Exactly. Right. Which is, of course, what would happen later. But like, yeah. it, it's his opening sort of olive branch is to say, "Hey, I want you to help develop your country the way that you want to." Mm. And if and and his hope was that if we let that happen, the countries will develop along Marxist lines, and then like it'll eventually like a revolution will sort of happen as a result. It's not guaranteed, but it's a good shot. That's probably what would happen. Or at the very least, if they're not going to be our buddies, then they're not going to be our enemies either. Right. If we provide nations with self determination, but they don't want to be a part of us, at the very least, they can they will be amenable to being close to us. Um, and so you see a lot of that in sort of Lenin's internationalism. You know, the common turn, the third international is set up during the early Soviet period with these explicit goals in mind, which is to, you know, help other nations have their communist revolutions and to develop a network of nations um, to create the working class society that they had sought to build. Um, and and so you see with those developments, um, Lenin's internationalism, which is extremely crucial in understanding his philosophy and understanding who he was as a politician, because Stalin was not like that. And we talked about that before in the Trotsky episode, we talked about socialism in one country and the sort of retreat and sort of trying to build socialism in, in only in Russia and then sort of letting the chips fall as they may and trying to get other nations later. Yeah. Um, but this is where I think all of the, the there's a lot of rhetoric with Lenin, right? Like he's a, he's a, he's a rhetorical writer. He's, you know, he's always, you know, and today we might call them tweet threads where he's shit talking people, right? <laughs> right. Where he's shit talking Martov or he's shit talking, you know, Kautsky or whoever, um, uh, or even kind of criticizing Rosa Luxemburg. Um, right. And, uh, and so he, but, 
that never you never lose sight of the fact that with Lenin he is still conceiving of himself as somebody who wants to gain power and then wants to try to maintain power in service of these broader goals of the international working class revolutionary society. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and so I think when we, when we think about him, we should think about him as somebody who is deeply pragmatic and deeply amenable to being wrong or change his mind or to shift in okay. priority. Um, which is not how Lenin's usually perceived. He's no. often perceived as sort of being like this, like, you know, fucking like, like ironclad bloodthirsty tyrant, which, you know, maybe that interpretation is correct, but at least, you know, Lieben's read of him and, and to a lesser extent, my read of, him, read of him is not like that. There are certainly elements of that there. I mean, we can certainly talk about sure. the, the shutting down the constituent assembly, the assembly, right. That, um, and the, the, the sort of the, the, the consequences of that, the development of the Cheka, which is the secret police that all that's all started under Lenin, you know, which right. becomes, which becomes the NKVD, which becomes the KGB, right? Like it's the, the secret police is an element of Lenin's development of the Soviet state. It's mm -hmm. not something that comes out of Stalin. It's something that Stalin makes bigger and, and, and um, makes permanent right. in a way that Lenin, I maybe never intended it to be. Lenin's idea of the Cheka was, well, we need these people because they're going to help root out the counter-revolutionary forces, which are going to hinder our ability to have a working government. Right. Yeah, you know, it makes sense. There's a logic to that, I guess. Sure. But, but you know, <laughs> and especially at a time where it's post-revolution, and then you go right from a revolution into a civil war, and then from right into a, the end of the civil war, you have a early period of economic catastrophe and social unrest all those yeah. go together yeah and so yeah like you could say the cheka is something that maybe is a problem i would yep. say it probably is yep um be, not so much because of the original initial goal right but more so that the long-term trajectory of a system like the cheka is to gain more and more power right right and to usurp power from the people yeah like I think I, I, this always happens when I have discussions about the Soviet Union. You got to you go. Okay, well, I, there's a lot of things that I disagree with that I think they made the wrong call, or they that like maybe the KGB should never have existed in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> and, but at the same time, you got to acknowledge the the conditions within which they existed when they made those decisions. You have to say, okay, well. This was a decision they made. I disagree with it, but maybe they had no other, you know, choice at that time. Yeah. And I think that, uh, that oftentimes in politics, you make the least worst option. Yeah. And, you know, and we talk about that or the lesser two evils or whatever, but like at some point you have to acknowledge that as you're continually choosing the lesser two evils, you're just still choosing evil. Yeah, that's and, right. And, and, and some of and and yeah. sometimes the bill comes due. Like at some point, it you can't. There's no going back. There's no real way of going back and trying to sort of put the toothpaste back in the tube. Well, yeah. and like you say, like there there was no ness not there was no way for Lenin to know that he would have uh, come on ill health and and you know he didn't necessarily know that he was going to die early and that Stalin would be the, the successor. And then that would be, you know, continuing and making these decisions worse that he had already made. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's, that's the crucial element here is with a lot of, with a lot of the, the story of Lenin and his, his governing style and his governing approach, um, there's a lot of what ifs because it, it, he, he did not live long enough. Yeah. Um, and you could make the argument that maybe it's really a problem that your whole government is built upon this one guy <laughs> being the glue that holds it together. Sort of seems like a problem. <laughs> maybe that's a problem. Right? Like, I think that is a problem. I think that's a huge problem. And that's a limitation of the idea of the Leninist party is that, that when you give that much power to one person, and something happens to that one person, yeah. you 
sometimes it's fine. Sometimes you can make that work. But a lot of times it's it, it ends up creating a situation that is rather chaotic that leads to maybe not the best of outcomes. You know, I say this all the time about like the death of Franklin Roosevelt, in 1945, Harry Truman becomes president, right? Like if, if when Roosevelt ran for his fourth term, if he had kept Henry Wallace right, as his right. vice president, I think the world would be very different today. Yeah. Be a little um, bit better place. Actually. I think it'd be a much better place <laughs> than today. And I don't think we would have dropped the bomb. Yeah. Um, or if we had dropped the bomb, we would have done what was the recommendation, which was not to drop it on civilians. Right. Yeah. That's Just right. Drop it out in the middle of nowhere to scare the shit out of people. As a show of force. Yeah. As a show of force. Um, uh, but I don't want to go too far into that. <laughs> we'll put a pin in that for later. Okay. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, um, or, you know, or I think about, you know, Lincoln's assassination in 1865 and Andrew Johnson becomes president and, and is terrible with Congress. And they end up impeaching him for violating the Tenure of Office Act. Like there's all this stuff where it's like uh, when you have that much power instituted in one person, it can fall apart, which is, yeah. I think, a very crucial lesson here, which is that when we're developing our societies, we're thinking about it, conceptualizing what does... A social society look like you know what does a left society look like a it shouldn't just be group. one guy on top it should just be <laughs> one guy on top and yeah because of the limitations of that and the overreach that one yeah. person who's imbued with that much power can take you know yeah. and you know you, you, people can shit on the u.s all they want trust me i do it every day but like in the united states there's a congress right like a president can only do so much yeah. Before a Congress or a Supreme Court will will check them, right? There wasn't anything like that. The Soviet Union that just didn't exist, right. and um, and so you know that's not to say that Lenin didn't have critics within his own government. He did, sure. or that or that they pushed back on him on proposals. They did, um, you know, specifically in relation to self determination. Um, you know, there was the more left of the party people like. You know, Alexander Kollontai, who were more critical of that perspective, like Rosa Luxemburg, who were openly critical to Lenin about this. And and uh, and um, but he never like, you know, he didn't make them an unperson because of it. You know, <laughs> right. uh, you know, Kollontai ended up being in a very high position of power. So for yeah. years, um, as we talked about in our Red Valkyries episode. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I think. To sort of finish up tonight and, and thinking about Lenin, I mean, again, our conversation is merely scratching the surface. Right. This book is 450 pages of extremely dense text. I read it over a period of a few months. Like, I was reading other things too, but like, I read it over a period of a few months. Yeah. It's an incredible book. I think, even if you're like, you're like, I hate Lenin, Lenin's awful, I think <laughs> it's worth reading to get a sense of the context of the period from a critical but sympathetic reader of Lenin. Right. Um, because there are problems with Lenin's approach. We can talk about those general problems, whether it's the, 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 the sort of tendency towards centralization. That's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. The tendency to contract and, and, and sort of uh, cut out math, the, the public in decision-making. That's a problem. Yeah. Um, the reliance upon sort of political pointies and, 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 and the sort of commissariat or the intelligentsia, right? Like that's a problem. Mm -hmm. One that even Lenin himself understood. Right. Um, almost to the point of anti-intellectualism, which is another element I think that you could be critical of Lenin is that sometimes okay. he is populism lent bordered on anti-intellectualism. Right. Um, which is an argument that, that Liebman makes in one of his chapters in relationship to different factions within the Bolsheviks. But I want to end the book, this discussion tonight talking about the end and what scholars, especially Trotsky scholars, often refer to as Lenin's last struggle, okay. um, which is to fight against Stalin okay. um, and Stalin's growth to power. So, um, so Lenin had three strokes between May of 1922 and March of 1923. Um, the last one would leave him uh, completely incapacitated. He could not speak. Jeez. The first one left him sort of 
mildly paralyzed in some factions, but he could still write, he could still dictate, and he could still speak. And so he spends the last, really the last two years of his life fighting against what he sees as a concentration of power um, to Stalin. Ah. And so uh, we get into people calling it Lenin's Testament or Lenin's Last Testament. Um, uh, people who are Stalinists argue that the Last Testament is a fraud. It doesn't actually, it's not real, um, which I don't buy. Um, I just, there's just too much. And even if you put the, if you put the Testament aside and let's just say it's fake, there's too much other stuff that just lends itself towards right. Lenin was deeply critical of Stalin and not, not thrilled about his, his ascension to power. Um, As a thoughtful so, person would be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so he, you know, so he's, so he's really trying to make some maneuvers um, that, uh, you know, that would sort of lead us to believe that like Lenin was not really that happy with Stalin really taking the reins of power and doing what he was doing. Um, and so what we see in this period is Lenin continually criticizing Stalin's choices, particularly in relation to foreign policy and national policy and the development of a Russian nationalism, which is something that, um, Lenin was very critical of, um, and Stalin was not, um, he often referred to Stalin as that great Russian nationalist. Um, which is ironic considering that, you know, Stalin was Georgian. Um, he wasn't even from Russia. Um, but uh, you see this sense that, um, you know, he really is starting to break with Stalin. And this really comes to a head in March of 1923, mere days before his final stroke, where he writes, he dictates a letter to Stalin and... Um, and he flat out says, this is from March 5th, 1923. I'm going to quote this in full. Okay. Um, you have been so rude as to summon my wife to the telephone and use bad language. Although she had told you that she was prepared to forget this, the fact nevertheless became known through her to Zinoviev and, Kam and Kamenev. I have no intention of forgetting so easily what has been done against me. And it goes without saying that as what has been done against my wife, I consider having been done against me as well. I ask you, therefore, to think it over whether you are prepared to withdraw what you have said and to make your apologies or whether you prefer that relations between us should be broken off. So now this, you know, people often make like light of this or like, oh, you know, Stalin said some naughty words and it pissed Lenin off. But you have to understand that in the context of what's all going on at the same time, which is Stalin yeah. is making a series of political choices that Lenin doesn't agree with. And Lenin's trying his damnedest to fight against them. Yeah. Um, and so uh, he did, he, in his sort of uh, final testament, he adds an addendum to it where he says, Stalin is too rude, and this defect, although quite tolerable in our midst and in dealings among us communists, becomes intolerable in a secretary general. This is why I suggest that the comrades think about a way of removing Stalin from that post and appointing another man in his stead, who in all other respects differs from comrade Stalin, and having only one advantage, namely that of being more tolerant, more loyal, more polite, and more considerate to the comrades, less capricious, etc. So, like, it's very clear that by the end, Stalin is someone Lenin does not want in power. Yeah. And it's not just personality. It's it's the, 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 those statements that he makes about Le Stalin's personality are backed up with Stalin's policies of sort of going against some of the self-determination of nations, going against some of the, the broader internationalist goals of Lenin um, in relation to foreign policy. And so you see this real clear, in my opinion, very clear break where uh, where Lenin pretty much doesn't want anything to do with him. Um, and and I think that for those who are the, the, the sort of the Stalinists or the, 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 the tankies or whoever, I think that regardless of whether or not the Testament is a real document, which I think it is, um, I think it's very important to know that that uh, 
there was there were very clear policy differences between Stalin and Lenin. Right. But unfortunately, and I think this is a crit criticism of Lenin, is that a lot of the decisions that Lenin had made in his years in power, the centralization of power, the reliance upon um, the reliance upon bureaucrats, the, the, the increasing bureaucratization and centralization of the state, the the de development of the Cheka, the, the shutting down of the constituent assembly. You see all of these elements um, where you see them in a Lenin where they, they seem bad because they seem as exceptions to other broader policy. But in they become more of the rule in the Stalin era. And mm -hmm. by the time that uh, Lenin dies in, you know, he dies in 1924, um, that uh, that uh, pretty much ends the, 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 the hope of what the Soviet Union was. Um, on March 6th, this is 1923. So this is, you know, a little bit after his stroke um, or close to around his stroke. Um, Kripskaya, his wife, which we talked about in Red Valkyries, told Kamenev that Lenin had resolved to crush Stalin politically. The next day, March 7th, a new attack of arteriosclerosis, a stroke, put an end to Lenin's political life. His political death saved Stalin's career and meant the doom of Leninism. Um, and I'm going to end with another passage from this end of, the, of this epilogue here, where Liebman writes, in the anguish and despair of these last struggles, in the doubt and uncertainty of these last questionings, Leninism reveals its true nature, thereby confounding the legion of those who scorn it. The heroic course of Lenin's last struggle does not disarm criticism of his work, but it does make plain the meaning of Leninism as a conception and outlook that are thoroughly democratic in character. Now, maybe that's going a little too far, I don't know, but I do think that's fair in the sense that any hopes of a democratic system that may have been able to be developed under Lenin died with Lenin. Yeah. Um, and with Stalin's rise to power, uh, the, the nation goes through a period of counter-revolution and reaction and eventually becomes the, 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 uh, the sort of malformed, the mangled state that it would become. Despite yeah. all of its achievements, which are many, yep. um, but uh, but there, but it, it does lend itself to the real limitations. And so, um, I think just in closing, what I would say is that Lenin was a deeply pragmatic political figure and revolutionary who was willing to change his mind based on where the public was and based where on his where his own conceptions were of what a party is, what the masses are in relation to that party, what a revolution would look like, what it's a, a, a social state looks like, and so on. We can certainly criticize him for his tendency towards bureaucratization, centralization, um, the development of, of, in, of institutions within the Soviet Union that were problematic, like the Cheka. Um, and that Lenin's, Lenin is arguably one of the most important political figures of the 20th century. And I think to understand the 20th century, you have to understand Lenin. Yeah. And so, uh, that's what makes him, I think, a, a figure of fascination for me because, you know, he is one of, like, I mean, I, I, he had such an outsized impact on the future of, of the 20th century right. for good or for ill. And so I think that uh, this is an excellent book. I think if you don't know anything about Lenin. It's a great book to start with because, okay. he, because Liebman does a very good job of laying out in very plain language, everything that's going on. Um, he cites everything. He gives you a sense of where you can go back to the original sources and read Lenin's original words and all that. He quotes Lenin at length. Um, and so uh, it's a book I think very much worth reading and one that um, I know that I'll go back to as a reference text uh, again and again. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think it's a great read and I think people should check it out. Um, you know, those who are, you know, good, bad, or indifferent about how they feel about Lenin, I still think it's a, a crucial study of a man and his, his era. Right. Yeah. Cause clearly he had a, um, like you say, like a, a ma major impact on society, the world. So 
yeah, kind of have to know about them a little bit. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, whether you like them or not. And yeah. and I I would say my my opinion of Lennon is is fairly close to Liebman's. I, I'm sympathetic but critical. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I've always said like I, I really a lot of the quotes that I see in meme form from Lennon, I've always been like, yeah, that sounds great. That's great. <laughs> but then you know I'm not a big fan of like the state system <laughs> <laughs> right and I think that's a really crucial thing and I think this is something for us on the left to think about which is that there's an enormous difference between theory and practice yeah and Lenin's story is a good example of him trying to integrate theory and practice right you know yeah. and and all of the 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 successes and failures that come with that because there's there's an enormous gap between what you wish for the world and what might actually be possible in the moment. Yeah. So you're constantly battling that out. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's what makes him an important figure to learn about. Um, and, uh, you know, and this book kind of makes him a person again, instead of like a figure, you know, like right. a statue, right? Yeah, the myth of Lenin. The myth person. of Lenin, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Lenin cult. Like it's not, it, it kind of, it kind of breaks that apart a little bit. I And yeah. I like that. I think that's, that's good. For sure. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the, we did have a question earlier in, oh, in the, the show that I thought uh, I'd bring it up now because we've got time, but uh, yeah, it was storm of storm for survival asked, what do you think the best thing Lenin did for the Soviet union? Oh, that's a great question. So I would say that the best thing that Lenin did for the Soviet union was, um, I think the development of national self-determination. Um, I think that's the most, I think it's the most long lasting legacy of Lenin. Yeah. So when we think about the anti-colonial struggles post-World War II, a lot of them, whether it's in Africa or in India um, or, or in Southeast Asia, they're all taking uh, yeah. influence from Lenin. In fact, I think he even makes a point of this. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, I think he does. Like, yeah. So he, he writes, but the development of revolutionary struggles all over the globe has bestowed a new significance upon Leninism. There is hardly any insurrectionary movement today from Latin America to Angola that does not lay claim to the heritage of Leninism. It has ceased to be merely a matter for historical study or for apologetical and quasi-religious exegesis. It serves as one of the brightest torches available to aid our observation of present day political phenomena. And I think that's right. Um, uh, I think that um, if you look at the, the legacies of somebody, people like Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Nkrumah, Walter Rodney, B.R. Ambedkar in India, Thomas Sankara, uh, Amilcar Cabral, the list goes on and on. All of them are tying their national revolutionary struggle and right of self-determination to Lenin. No. So to me, that's the best thing I think he ever did because it's the most long lasting legacy of Lenin that people can still learn from today is, is the commitment to a, 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 a revolution of both the workers and peasants connected both in national determination and into international struggle for the working class. Yeah. That that's, those are really key crucial things that I think um, that he did that were very good. And then on top of all that, I mean, just, just, you know, being the theoretician of the revolution itself. Right. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I think the last page of state and revolution is, is, is fascinating because he basically just says, I was going to write these other sections but I didn't because we actually had a revolution. And at yeah. the end, he basically says, it's a hell of a lot. He, he says, it's a lot more fun to lead one than to write about one. And it's like, that's kind of a boss move. Like, you yeah. know, and so um, I think being a theoretician of revolution and national struggle um, for oppressed peoples, those that's the, when people think of Lenin in the third world, that's what they think of, you know? And uh, when they see his name or they see his face, they see him as a liberatory figure. Yeah. And that, that I think is the biggest legacy and probably his, his greatest contribution. Cool. Well, I guess 
all that's left is uh, what are we covering next time? So next time we are going to be doing a very, we're doing a pivot. So I had so much fun doing a podcast with left of the projector. We talked all about Oppenheimer. We talked about the Oppenheimer movie. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, now I want to talk about the book. So uh, next time is going to be the first in a two part series. This, this year we're doing kind of episodes that kind of loosely tie together there's two, there's going to be like two series. One is about Anton Panacek. We're going to do like three episodes on Anton Panacek. Okay. So the first one is the one we already did about Marxism and Darwinism. Later in the summer, sometime in May, we're going to be doing his book, Lenin is Philosopher. So we're going to kind of go back to thinking about Lenin from a sort of libertarian Marxist perspective from Panacek. And we're going to end later in the year that three-part series with his book, um, Workers' Councils. We're going to talk about council communism. Oh, cool. I'm really excited about talking about those three. So that's like a little series we're going to do. Nice. But before we get to that, we're going to be doing a two-part series about the development and the rise of the American national security state. Um, and so the next book that we're going to be doing in two weeks is American Prometheus, um, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by uh, Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin. Um, and people and that's go, when Why we get to talk about how awful Truman is. And we get to talk about <laughs> one, we get to talk about awful Truman is. Yes, absolutely. Can't fucking wait. I'm so excited. Two, we get to talk about the fact that that um, Oppenheimer was probably the most high profile victim of McCarthyism mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and had, you know, and because of his associations with the Communist Party. We can talk about the legacy of McCarthyism and the 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 horrible stain upon American political life. Yeah. And we get to talk about the development of the atomic bomb. And, and I think all of those things are extremely relevant. For sure. So that'll be what we do next time. And then the episode we do right after that will be the part two of that series. We're going to be talking about David Halberstam's classic book, The Best and the Brightest, which is his premier political history about um, the Vietnam War and right. how America got into the Vietnam War. So uh, I'm really excited about sort of talking about the growth and the development of the national security state and its implications for today. So those will be the next two episodes that we do. Right on. And I guess that leaves us with where can people find you? So you can always find me at justinclark.org. Website's right down there. You can also find me on social media at Justin Clark PH. PH stands for public history. Um, I am currently working on a few different articles for work. I'm working on some Indiana history related topics for work. Um, and so writing things like that and, um, and sort of, you know, working on this show and doing all this great stuff. So, um, but I post book reviews and all kinds of little things on my uh, social media. So I'm, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok, I'm on threads, I'm on blue sky. I'm on all those. Uh, I don't do Twitter. Um, and not really active on Facebook. Um, but Instagram is where I'm mostly active. So you can you reach out to me there or whatever. Um, yeah. Or you can always drop me an email on my website. Um, and then as I always end our show, um, please consider becoming a patron. A patron, um, Patreon.com. Uh, was it forward slash skeptical leftist? Yeah, patreon.com uh, slash skeptical leftist. Yes. And so become a patron. Corey's been doing really ex ex excellent work putting out these great clips. Um, and he's working with a team of folks to come up with some really good graphics for us. And we're just really excited about all the things that we're doing. And so, you know, you can help us keep doing more of what we like to do best here um, yep. by becoming a patron. I highly encourage you to do so. Right on. Well, thank you, Justin. And uh, thank you to everyone who was in the chat and who uh, watched in the uh, various places. And uh, I would apologize if I didn't get to your comment, but uh yeah it's all good and thanks everybody for your comments and your questions um if we didn't get to your comment or question put it in the, put it in the comments in the video uh you know and if you're polite we'll get back to you that's right <laughs> if you're polite if you're polite. <laughs> that's right all right thanks <laughs>